this section, we are going to understand how cooling can be achieved without using a compressor whatsoever. How can we bring thermal comfort to people but not use neither a natural refrigerant nor a conventional refrigerant. This completely overturns conventional cooling on its head and these systems are called either direct evaporative cooling or indirect direct evaporative cooling or they can even be called hybrid cooling if you merge them with a conventional air conditioning system. So let's try and understand these very potent cooling technologies that can be applied at least in the hot and dry regions of tropical countries such as India. So to understand this technology we will first understand the way these systems work in terms of the science and the engineering behind them, how are they operated in on a day-to-day -day basis and what are some of the design principles that can be applied to come up with some sizing parameters for example how large in terms of the amount of air flow rate uh, that would, would you need for such a system how much water will they consume so on and so forth and finally we will look at how they are better than the conventional cooling technologies in some cases but they also have some limitations compared to the to the flexibility that conventional air conditioning can sometimes provide and we are going to look at a few examples of buildings in India that use this cooling system to dramatically reduce their energy consumption, their carbon footprint and also the amount of money that they spend on running these systems to cool their buildings and cool the people. The first sub-classification of this gamut of technologies is called direct evaporative cooling and as the name suggests it will involve the evaporation of some substance to make people feel cool. And we're going to use a very real life experience to understand this technology in the next slide. The working principle of this technology essentially is the same as that of the effect that perspiration has when it evaporates on from your, our skin. One of the mechanisms that the human body employs to make you feel cool when it's hot outside is that your body secretes sweat. The sweat as it evaporates picks up the latent heat of evaporation from your skin leaving just the salt behind but the water is gone and that makes you feel cool. An evaporative cooler essentially just creates a, the, the, the same effect but uses a more sophisticated technology for doing this and instead of using sweat uses just water. The benefits of this technology will be delved into a little later but you can through this technology just to whet your appetite for this get about 20 degrees of cooling compared to the warm or hot or even hot temperatures outside. So imagine it's a 40 degree um, situation in an interior city in India say for example Aurangabad. You can end up with air that is cooled to 20 degrees without the use of a refrigerant and without using much power. Yeah? So let's understand how these systems work and what are their limitations and constraints. The reason why these evaporative coolers use water compared to other substances is because water is known to have a very high latent heat of evaporation. For every kg of water that you are able to evaporate, we look at how it does the evaporation a little later, but for every kg that you are able to evaporate, you can pick up 540 kilocalories of heat from whichever substance is ready to provide it to it. So if it is the air that can provide the warmth to the water to evaporate it, it is the air that will get cooled in return. This is what this technology harnesses. Because of this effect, the temperature of the air drops. However, as you can imagine, when you evaporate something into air, water for instance in this case, the air then becomes more humid. Hence, even though its temperature drops and its, its enthalpy to some degree reduces because of that, it is balanced by the increase in the amount of energy that you're putting into the air through humidity. So what happens is with these technologies, the net amount of energy in the air does not change. There is a trade-off between the reduced temperature and the increased humidity and hence the enthalpy which is the sum total of the sensible heat and the latent heat remains constant in these systems. But there is a very palpable and verifiable cooling effect because the temperature of the air does drop and we'll look at how this plays out in terms of psychrometry in the, the coming slide. Of course, you can imagine that since the whole benefit of this technology can only be felt when there is enough room for evaporation, 
these technologies usually work well only when the outside air is relatively dry and it's ready to absorb adequate the adequate amount of moisture to then cool the air right so they do not work in places with high levels of humidity you need dry air for this technology to work quite well pictorially uh, what does this mean this constraint of having dry air for the technology to work well so this is a psychrometric chart which we have been studying in our previous modules on psychrometry you can see here on the x-axis the temperature values going from about negative 5 all the way up to 43 and on the y-axis you see the humidity values this is grams of humidity per kg of air right and as you can see this is about 2 4 all the way up to 24 grams of moisture per kg of air there are two possible conditions that have been shown here for illustration this would be the psychrometric condition here at this blue dot for something like Pune, a city like Pune, which is hot but it's quite dry the humidity levels are quite low now in this situation an evaporative cooler could work really well because there's a lot of room to add humidity before it reaches the saturation point. This is a saturation curve of 100% humidity. And as you can imagine, there is a lot of cooling possible for taking this, uh, before taking this air all the way to saturation. However, for a humid place like Mumbai, which has lower temperature maybe than Pune, but it has a very high humidity level, one can imagine that its journey is prematurely truncated because it hits the saturation curve right away. The amount of cooling that one can get can be visualized by seeing the horizontal distance that can be covered as it goes along these lines of constant enthalpy. These are all lines of constant enthalpy, right? So temperature drops as you go here, but in evaporation, because you're adding humidity, essentially the path of these lines is in this direction. And eventually it reaches the human thermal comfort zone right and as you can imagine in the case of Mumbai by the time it hits the saturation curve it has gotten very little cooling done whereas in the case of Pune say if you bring it all the way here you will see that it has a lot of cooling that has been possible and we will show this on the chart in the next couple of slides this chart shows you all the cooling processes that are possible with evaporation in, in uh, used in different methods in evaporative cooling like we just said earlier there's a trade-off between the reduced temperature as you move to the left but the enthalpy in enthalpy remains the same because the humidity is rising as well all right so now let's see this in the form of an, a small little animation that we have here so this is a typical psychrometric chart when you evaporatively cool the air it goes from the left from the right to the left sorry and the cooling that can be achieved is essentially the projection of this hypotenuse onto the the x-axis here so in this case you can see that the air starts off at about 42 degrees and ends up at somewhere close to about 25 degrees so that's about 17 degrees of cooling that can be achieved through this evaporative cooling system. Now, that's the science of this whole evaporative cooling process. How do you actually apply this to harness this in homes, in offices, etc., to make people feel cool? The principle is actually very, very simple. All you need for these systems to harness the power of evaporation is to provide ample contact area between water and air. So this is a typical pad it's called a cellulose pad which has a lot of surface area per unit of um, volume and if you can pr uh, provide a continuous stream of water that can keep this pad wet and if there is some mechanism to blow air through it it can be through a fan what happens is the warm air at about 42 degrees as shown in the previous psychrometric chart comes into contact with the water the water picks up the latent heat of evaporation from the air and what turns out on the other side is air which has lost its latent the latent heat of evaporation to the water and that cool but humid air exits and cools people sufficiently in hot and dry regions of India that's how
a science principle is converted to an engineering technology. How does one go about designing such a system? Right? By designing, uh, we mean how can we estimate the performance of such a system in different psychrometric conditions. So remember we said that you can take 42 degree air and drop it down to 25, 26. Now how does one go about predicting this numerically? So to do that we are going to use an equation which relates the initial temperature, the efficiency of the system to predict the outgoing air temperature. Now let's understand this equation a little bit. On the left side here, you have the supply air temperature, dB with a subscript x. dB here stands for dry bulb temperature, which is just the air temperature. S is supply air. So wherever you see S, it's for supply air. A is for the ambient air. Right? The only other temperature that we need to know is the wet bulb temperature. The wet bulb temperature, as we all know from our study of psychrometry, is the lowest temperature that is possible by taking the air condition to maximum saturation, which means if you were to use pure evaporation and achieve 100% efficiency, the cooling that you would get would be or the final temperature that you could end up with is the wet bulb temperature. It's the theoretically minimum temperature that you can get through pure evaporation. All right. So to be able to predict the outside or the outgoing air temperature, one needs to know the starting temperature, which is the dry bulb of the ambient air. We need to know what is the maximum possible difference that you can get if you had 100% efficiency of evaporation, which is called the wet bulb depression, as you know from your study of psychrometry. And one needs to know the efficiency of that cooling pad or the cellulose pad that we spoke of. In the uh, slide here, you can see the typical values for efficiency range from about 80 to 90 percent right so say if you could get a maximum of 20 degrees drop because of the psychrometric starting conditions most pads are only able to achieve 90 percent of that cooling because of course to get 100 percent cooling you would have to have an infinitely deep pad an infinite amount of contact time right but those are ideal conditions in real world engineering systems you would get something less than that so let's take a number of somewhere close to 80 to 90 percent and these numbers are published by the manufacturers of these cellulose pads. If you use that value here in, the, in this equation, you will find that you can calculate the dry bulb supply temperature because you usually would know the starting point of the air temperature. You would also use the psychrometric chart to figure out what the wet bulb temperature would be and you could use a value of say approximately 85 percent. And through this, you can predict the supply air temperature. So let's work a small example. Here is air that is starting off at about 30 degrees and close to about 40% humidity. That's your starting air condition. To know the wet bulb temperature for that, for that uh, specific condition, all one has to do is go right to the edge of the saturation curve and you would get your wet bulb temperature. In this case, it is 19 degrees. So that's the starting point. This is the dry bulb temperature. This is the wet bulb temperature. And this is the efficiency that has been assumed for this case, 90%. Which means that theoretically, one could have got approximately 11 degrees of temperature drop. But I can only get 90% of it in the real world. And hence, I can get a maximum temperature drop of about 9.9 .9 degrees. Which means the exiting temperature will be close to not 19, but something more like 21 degrees. So this is a small little design process one can employ to know whether the evaporative cooler will perform adequately for the application that you're trying to use it for. What are some of the places that this technology can be used right now to replace conventional air conditioning? Evaporative cooling is already being used in industrial applications where it's too expensive and the volumes are too vast to cool through air conditioners. So this is an immediate application, for example, warehouses where humidity levels can be tolerated to some degree in poultry farms, so on and so forth. It can be used in commercial spaces where one does not need to maintain humidity levels to a very low point and one can be a little flexible with it. For example, if you have a large corporate office and have a big entrance lobby 
where one does not need to maintain 22, 23 degrees and 50% humidity, which is what is conventionally you know, thrust upon us as a standard for commercial air conditioning. If one can take higher temperatures, say something in the order of 25, 26 degrees, and one can have slightly higher humidities of about 70%, and yet keep the people comfortable, healthy, one could use this in commercial places. Residential places have already been using this for decades before air conditioning came and replaced these technologies from in, uh, interior cities in India. So they can certainly be used there. They can be used in the poultry industry where humidity levels actually are, are required to reduce the amount of heat stress. And so can they be used in the horticulture industry. To understand the environmental and cost benefits of this technology, one must recollect that in the working of this uh, evaporative air cooling system, there was no compressor. Now a compressor is of course a very useful technology when it comes to creating very very low temperatures that air conditioners are able to provide. However, they have a very high amount of energy consumption. An evaporative cooler completely avoids this big energy consumption by using small pumps, small fans because all one needs to do is provide a cascade of water and a way to blow air through it. When you do an analysis of the energy efficiency ratio or the coefficient of performance of these systems compared to business as usual air conditioners, one can see that while for conventional ACs, the COP is somewhere in the range of 2.8 to 3 for a 3 star AC for example in India, evaporative air coolers or EACs as they are called can have a energy efficiency ratio or a COP of approximately 20. This is about an order of magnitude better than a conventional AC and all because of the fact that an, a compressor is completely avoided. It also is a system that uses a natural refrigerant, in this case water, for providing the cooling. And this water, I know people might be alarmed by saying, by, by thinking how much water would one need to be able to cool a, a room or a, or a building if with this cooling technology versus an air conditioner. That can be calculated using the psychrometric chart as we will show you in exercises later. However, one can keep in mind that this water can be harnessed from rainwater. It can be harnessed from a grey water recycling system within the premises. And the cooling needs of the building can be met through these water efficiency measures as well. And because of this lack of use of refrigerants, lack of use of a compressor, they are much cheaper to run than conventional air conditioning technologies and even their initial installation requires less capital cost than a conventional AC. So this is a win-win-win situation. The only demerit or the concern with this technology is that it does not work very well in humid conditions and we're going to look at technologies that are even able to go around that barrier but still stay within the realm of non-usage of compressors and non-usage of refrigerants. That will come, come up a little later. Just to reiterate the, the constraints that we just mentioned. One is that they can work really well only in low humidity areas of, of the country. Earlier uh, versions of this technology used to have some constraints with respect to the, the lifespan of these pads, uh, the cellulose pads. They used to corrode or they would have biological growth. However, that issue has been addressed by use of modern materials that do not allow the bacteria or mold or algae to grow on those mediums. The final consideration that, that uh, can count as a constraint is that because these systems have a lot of air requirement, the amount of air that is required in the room needs to actually be provided from the outside. These are called once through systems with zero recycling. This can be a bit of a constraint for commercial buildings where one cannot get large volumes of air through the building because of the, the reduced space between buildings these days in commercial areas, etc. And hence, this can uh, sometimes constrain the application of this technology. Finally, because it's the airflow that's doing all the cooling, one might end up with very high air velocities and there might be some parts of a, of a building or a room which is being used, which is being cooled through evaporative cooling.
where you will have very high flow rates of air and can create fluttering of, of paper, etc. if it's an office. This is one constraint that has also been addressed to some degree through better ducting systems that uniformly distribute this airflow across a large floor area. Now, in this section, we are going to look at the alteration of direct evaporative cooling, which has a lot of virtues, but it has constraints with respect to the, uh, the fact that you cannot operate that technology in places with very high humidity. So can we work with evaporative cooling, but do away with this problem of humidity? To some degree, it can be addressed through what's called indirect direct evaporative cooling. What is the science principle of this technology? The science principle is somewhat similar to evaporative cooling. However, it's able to cool the air without adding humidity. It does this through a process of heat exchange, which we will depict later through diagrams and, and images and animations. If you remember in evaporative cooling, the, the psychrometric path was a purely diagonal psychrometric path, where as you reduce the temperature, your humidity was rising. With indirect evaporative cooling, you are able to reduce the temperature without adding humidity. So it's psychrometry, the process looks a little different and we'll show you this a little later. The cooling effect is generated not through the adding of humidity. It's actually generated by doing heat exchange between two surfaces. One is a cool surface and one is the warm air that is coming in from the outside. Yeah. So we'll look at this a little bit later. Uh, the indirect evaporative cooling, by the way, addresses the sensible cooling needs without adding latent heat to the system. That's a big advantage. And there is actually a, a loss or a reduction in the total amount of heat. If you remember, in the case of evaporative cooling, the, the trade-off between temperature and humidity led to a situation where the total enthalpy of the air starting and ending was approximately the same. However, in this case, there is actually a net reduction in the enthalpy of the air, right? The advantage of these systems is that they can operate in, in moderately humid conditions because it does not require the addition of humidity to bring, up, bring about the cooling in the room, right? So this has a, a very emphatic advantage compared to direct evaporative cooling systems. Here is a abstraction of the evaporative, indirect evaporative cooling system. In this system, you can see that there is a flow of water similar to an evaporative cooling system. However, there is two streams of air. So first let's understand what's this primary and secondary air stream. So first imagine a conventional evaporative cooler where you have a cascade of water and air is being pulled upwards perhaps through a fan that is placed up here. As you pull air up through this, in this direction, and it meets the water as it's going up, it gets cooled. Now in conventional evaporative cooling systems, this exhaust air would have been used in the room to cool the people. However, if I can allow this air to exhaust and not use that air, but rather, Take advantage of the fact that this entire region has now become cool because as that air cools as it goes up, it also cools the surrounding surfaces in which this air is enclosed. And hence, if I do this in thin walled tubes, it could be metal, it could be plastic, but as long as it's thin, the cooling that is generated can be transferred or it can absorb heat from another stream of air that can be brought from the outside. So what an indirect evaporative cooling system does is that it employs evaporation in one, one part, but now uses a process of heat exchange where warm air, say at 40 degrees outside, comes and bathes the outside of these cooled tubes and that cool air is then used in the room. So in this way, you can have cool, non-humidified air, not dehumidified, but non-humidified air that can be used by people to feel cool in the building. I can get even more cooling than this by adding, by re-adding a direct evaporative cooling system here because this air has low temperature and the same amount of humidity as this. If I'm working in a 
low humidity region I can get even more cooling by adding humidity here this is the second stage of cooling and get even cooler air than was the case with a pure indirect evaporative cooler however there is slightly more humidity that this air has this is an indirect direct evaporative cooling system and it is able to bring about very very low temperatures compared to either the direct evaporative cooler or just the indirect evaporative cooler so let's understand this a little bit further in the next few slides here is what a real world system that employs these two processes looks like all right so let's understand this this first stage here is an indirect evaporative cooling stage you always have all indirect cooling happening first and then direct evaporative cooling and you'll see this in the psychrometric chart and it'll make sense why you would never have this process first and then this process okay so here you have indirect evaporative cooling I'll explain the process again here after that I have a direct evaporative cooling and in this case I also have for some months of the year I might need a lot of dehumidification if it's a, a wet part of the world for example say in a Chennai or Mumbai or Kolkata you might need an AC at some times of the year so this system is a di indirect direct hybrid cooling system and it can actually meet the cooling needs throughout the year for any region in India all right so now let's understand each of these units separately in the indirect evaporative cooling stage as we had mentioned there are small thin walled tubes with a source of water on the top kind of like an evaporative cooler almost like that however what happens is the air that is brought in from the bottom gets cooled as it goes up it's allowed to exhaust rather than it being used in the room what has happened however is that the outside of these tubes have become cool sometimes they can cool all the way down to about 20 22 degrees now if this is 22 degrees and you have warm air from the outside at 40 degrees the outgoing temperature will be somewhere in between the two say it's 30 degrees right now you have air that was at 40 with a certain amount of humidity it has now become 30 degree air with the same amount of humidity there has been no reduction in the humidity and no addition either because these two systems only exchange temperature or heat but do not exchange any mass all right now this air can be passed through an a through a direct evaporative cooler especially because you haven't added any humidity and if there is scope for adding humidity so it's a very dry region then you can get another boost of cooling by adding the humidity back here which cools it further however does not however is now a little bit more humid than the starting air yeah now remember we said that there might be some situations in India or any part of the world which is very wet and humid where you might need to dehumidify the air of course in those situations what you would first need to do is shut off this system because you definitely don't want to make it worse by adding more humidity right if you can create a system where you then bypass this air but instead of running it through a evaporative cooling system you run it through a air conditioner then what you have is warm air that has become cool but not humidified is cooled further and humidified as well in this conventional air conditioning unit however you have first achieved a lot of cooling very efficiently without using a refrigerant without using a compressor you've gotten a bulk of it done you've gotten it down from 40 to about 30 degrees and now all you need to do is take it down by another four or five degrees in this cooler or in this air conditioner rather what this does is that it allows you to have a much smaller compressor much less refrigerant and hence much more energy efficiency is possible by using this system so you can almost think of this as a pre-cooling system for a conventional AC even if you do need to run an AC so now let's look at the psychrometric processes that these systems undergo remember in the evaporative cooling uh, systems we saw that the path that is taken by the air is this path going diagonally towards the saturation curve in the case of the indirect stage of evaporative cooling as you can imagine 
While I do reduce my temperature, which is I go left, I however do not add humidity. I remain at the same level of humidity and hence I go purely to the left, right? So that would be indirect evaporative cooling. If I do add another stage, one can imagine that I can add another diagonal process here and that would represent indirect direct evaporative cooling and the combination of the two looks like this. Yeah. So this is the indirect stage. As you can see, I have gotten a sizable amount of temperature reduction. Now, because it's a relatively dry place, even after this stage, I have some scope for adding more humidity and getting even more temperature reduction. So this is the evaporative cooling stage, which brings me closer to the saturation curve, but still tolerable. And hence, this is the total amount of cooling that I get. And as you will see in the subsequent chart as well, the, the temperature that is possible through a combination of this and this is lower than the temperature you could have gotten by doing either this or this separately. By, by this separately, what I mean is imagine if I just took the diagonal line right from point one all the way up to the curve here. I am not able to get down to this level because of the shape of this curve itself. Right? So this one, the sum is greater than the parts here. Right? The, the, the combined effect is better than any one of the individual processes done separately. This is a picture of this heat exchange unit as it's called, which does the indirect evaporative cooling. It looks very different from the pad that I showed you earlier, which is a, a cellulose pad with a lot of surface area to make contact between the water and the air. In this case, what makes contact is not the water and the air. What makes real contact here is the two air streams. One is the one that has been evaporated and is cool, but through a thin wall makes contact, thermal contact with another warm stream of air. So that's this indirect direct evaporative cooling unit. Just like the evaporative cooling system, to be able to understand the performance of this, we would need to be able to predict what is the lowest temperature that I can get on the outside if I know my initial starting conditions and I know the approximate efficiencies of both those processes, the direct and indirect evaporative cooling stage. And as one can imagine, because it's a two step process, there would be two equations involved. So let's understand the two equations that are involved to be able to estimate the outside temperature or the temperature that I will get on the downstream side of this equipment. All right, so there are quite a few subscripts that we will need to understand. In the evaporative cooling system, we had this thing called supply air and ambient air and it was simple enough because it was just one stage. However, because I have two stages of cooling, I will have a first stage and a second stage, right? So we have a subscript of FS, which is first stage. And this is what we see in the first equation. So the first part of the equation, looks at the temperature of the air emerging from the first stage, which is called the FS or the subscript is FS for that. This equation relates the dry bulb of the first stage exiting air in relation to the ambient dry bulb temperature, which is the temperature of the outside air. And just like in the, in the uh, direct evaporative cooling system, we had the wet bulb depression, which is the lowest temperature that you can get through pure evaporation is captured through this part of the equation. This looks at the maximum delta possible. And once one multiplies that with the efficiency of the cooling process. Now one can imagine that you can't really get the same kind of efficiency in an indirect system as you would get in a direct system. Because in a direct system, there's actual mass contact between the air and the water. Whereas in the indirect evaporative cooling system, it's only a thermodynamic or a thermal contact between them. So the efficiencies in this case are a little bit lower than what is observable in the case of direct evaporative coolers. A good number to use would be approximately 70%, right? And it is dependent upon the type of the heat exchanger that one uses on the air flow rate. For example, if the flow rate is very high, the amount of efficiency you would get is actually lower because there's less contact time between the water and the air in the evaporative cooling tubes.
So when one multiplies 70% approximately with this dry bulb depression that you can get and subtracting it from the outside air temperature, one arrives at the exiting temperature from the first stage and a similar process is then used to estimate the temperature from the second stage which is the direct evaporative cooling stage. Now let's see how one can apply this in a real world situation for a typical relatively moderate humid location in India. Alright, so say one starts off in a city with approximately 30 degrees dry bulb temperature on the outside and has a humidity of close to about 35%. So this would be the starting point for the first stage. As we had already mentioned that in the first stage the air purely loses just heat without adding any humidity into the process. So the first stage will be about moving from here to here to somewhere in the middle of the thermal comfort range or the, the psychrometric chart and that is captured by this equation. So the maximum possible drop would have been 11 degrees just like in the evaporative cooling stage. However, one can only get about 70% of that efficiency. So the way this number is arrived at is one would take this point go right to the edge of this curve and that would be about 19 degrees. That is the lowest temperature one can get is about 19 degrees through such a system. And this distance is nothing but 70% of this length projected onto the horizontal. That's how one arrives at 30 minus 7.7. .7. That would be somewhere close to about 22.3 degrees, which is this point as one can see. It's about 22.3 degrees. All right, so that's the exiting temperature from the first stage. And now we're going to add an evaporative cooling stage to this part of the system. Now this functions like a classical evaporative cooling system where you can revert to those 90% kind of efficiencies because now there is direct contact between the air and the water. So we revert to a efficiency of about 90%. In this case, however, we have to find out the wet bulb temperature for the new starting condition. Not this starting condition, but this starting condition. And as you can imagine, the wet bulb temperature for this air is lower than what it would have been for this one, right? So if I extend this point all the way to the saturation curve, I end up with a temperature of about 16.4 degrees. So the maximum drop is somewhere close to about 6 degrees, right? But I can only get 90% of that maximum possible drop which turns out to be about 5.3 degrees and hence the exiting temperature here which is nothing but a projection of this all the way down to the horizontal axis is approximately 17 degrees. It's 22.3 minus 5.3 sorry there's a typo this is 5.3 and that's 17 degrees centigrade right so that would be the exiting temperature from the entire system. What are the advantages of a indirect direct evaporative cooling system versus purely direct evaporative cooling system that is very emphatically presented in this psychrometric chart. Imagine I start here in any city uh, that has these kinds of psychrometric conditions say approximately 40 degrees ambient temperature and a relatively moderate humidity of about 30 to 40 percent right that's the starting point here. I could take two possible routes to get to a relatively cool state. The first one would have been a direct evaporative cooling state and that would have led to a temperature, an exit temperature of somewhere close to about 23 degrees. This is the coolest I could get through just a simple evaporative cooling system. However, if I'm able to make my system a little more sophisticated and add another cooling stage, right, the indirect stage, then what I can do is I can first do as much cooling as I can without adding humidity. So I move to the left as efficiently as possible without adding any humidity. And now I can use up the remaining of the length here and absorb some humidity without making it too high on an absolute level. So this is the direct stage after doing the indirect stage. And as you can see, I have achieved a lower final temperature compared to this case. And even my humidity levels are lower for this system. And you can imagine 
that the outgoing humidity from this, this equipment would be much more pleasant, would be much more acceptable to the occupants and you would use less water because you're adding less amount of humidity compared to a pure direct evaporative cooling system. So these systems can actually be more efficient than direct evaporative cooling systems in almost all cases. Of course, the only drawback is that the starting cost might be a little bit higher compared to a simple direct evaporative cooler. This slide here presents to you a simple way of estimating the energy conservation possibilities and hence cost as well as carbon efficiency that is possible through indirect evaporative cooling systems. So this is just a simple case study of a building that needs approximately 20,000 cubic meters of air per hour. And the goal is to cool that from 38 degrees centigrade starting point and 20% RH down to 24 degrees and 55% RH. This is con very often uh, considered to be a typical comfort temperature and humidity for human occupants. And the formula for calculating the tonnage that we are saving is this, which is the mass flow rate into the enthalpy change that I am creating. Just one thing that I wanted to point out is if you can imagine the lines of enthalpy as running diagonally in this direction, one can imagine that the starting enthalpy is much higher than the final enthalpy, right? Because it is not only is it cooler, uh, lower in terms of temperature, but it also has not added so much humidity as you have reduced temperature, right? So the final air is lower energy air compared to the starting air and hence one can calculate a delta enthalpy which one couldn't do in a pure evaporative cooling system. So reverting back to the example that we were um, delving into, one can see that the tonnage that is saved through this system is the flow rate of the air into the density. So this is the volumetric flow rate into the density into the enthalpy that one is reducing through the system into a conversion factor to convert the kilocalories into, into kilojoules, so on and so forth. And what we end up with is that for this kind of a system, if I did this purely through an indirect direct evaporative cooling system, I would end up with 23 tons of cooling reduction. Right Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out in the conventional business as usual case, how much energy would you have needed to operate a 23 ton air conditioning system and we'll compare it with the power consumption of a 23 ton or 20,000 cubic meter per hour indirect evaporative cooling system. That has been worked out over here. A typical air conditioner that is used in large buildings has an efficiency which is to the order of about 0.7 kilowatts of power required per ton of cooling. So one can imagine if I multiply this by 23, which is the tonnage that I am getting through this cooler, I can figure out how much energy such a system would have taken if I did it through air conditioning. So multiplying 23 tons of cooling with 0.72 and the hours of operation, I can figure out that I would have had to uh, provide approximately 91,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year. And at about seven and a half rupees per kilowatt hour, that would have cost me approximately 6,83,000 rupees per year. And the capital cost that I would have saved if I did it through indirect evaporative cooling versus a conventional cooling system is approximately 6,25,000. So not only is the system saving me approximately 6.7, 6.8 lakh rupees a year, it's also costing me 6.2 lakh rupees less compared to a conventional air conditioning system. So this is really a win-win situation in terms of initial cost as well as long-term operational cost. As you can imagine, this indirect direct evaporative cooling system is much more versatile than a pure evaporative cooling system. And hence, you can see that this technology can be used for commercial buildings, which is something that was not really possible for direct evaporative cooling systems because of its constraints in terms of the volume of air that was needed in terms of the amount of velocity that the systems generated. Here, because you're doing part of the cooling through the water, part through the air, you're able to keep both these values a little bit lower. 
and hence much more comfortable and acceptable for the needs of a typical office. Of course, these systems are still very good for residential, uh, residential areas as well and for the factories that we talk, talked about where large cooling needs do exist but they are too expensive to be run through conventional air conditioning systems. One big advantage of air coolers, direct or indirect, doesn't matter, compared to air conditioners is this, that all the air that emerges from an indirect evaporative cooler is 100% fresh and recirculated air in the sense that it's air that has come from the outside has been cooled, filtered and then provided into the building. Whereas in a air conditioning situation of a, of a split AC, there is no replenishment of fresh air, especially in split ACs. But even in central ACs, there's usually a lot of recycling of air that's going on. Now, this one difference makes a big difference in the well-being, in the mood, in the state of productivity of the people working inside these kinds of spaces or even sleeping or living. What that does, this fresh air improves the amount of oxygen that we breathe. It reduces building sickness syndrome, reduces headaches, so on and so forth. And usually people report much more satisfaction with buildings that are cooled through coolers versus buildings that are cooled through air conditioners. Here are uh, a couple of numerical examples of real buildings. This is for a building in Pune. It's a factory shed that was cooled with a indirect uh, direct uh, evaporative cooling system and it was compared to what could have been possible through a pure evaporative cooling system. Right? Both of these are better than a conventional air conditioning system. However, the two-stage or the indirect direct evaporative cooling system is even more advantageous than just a evaporative cooling system. Let's look at the uh, clearly visible advantages of this versus this. We can see that the system was approximately a 22 to 25 ton system. This is the amount of compressor energy that it replaced in a way. And you can see that the total power required for running this system, the two-stage cooling, was only approximately 9.6 input kilowatts, IKW, whereas for this one, it would have been 28 kilowatts. Even the water consumption for the system is much lower, 131 liters per hour compared to 306 liters per hour. And this is all because, again, part of the cooling is happening through an indirect stage which uses less water and part of it happens through the direct stage which uses the uh, higher amount of water. Right? In terms of costs as well, one can see that the installed cost of this system is a little bit more but the operating cost is much lower because of the power requirement being much lower. So the power requirement is about one third and hence that is reflected here as well. The same fact is depicted visually. This was a modeling study that was done for a factory shed in Pune again. And here are all the conventional air conditioning systems. These are the air cooled systems, the direct expansion, and these are the water cooled systems. And as one can see, they all have some sort of a value which is in the realm of approximately Five, uh, 650 to about 550 megawatt hours per year to cool that building. However, if one moves to a indirect direct evaporative cooling system, this is the most sophisticated alternative that was possible. It has an energy consumption of somewhere close to about 350 megawatt hours per year. Yeah. So this would of course be the most environmentally, economically and even in terms of just human well-being, the best system for cooling this building. The second case study we'd like to show you is a typical conventional commercial building in Pune. Again, the reason why you will see a lot of examples in Pune, by the way, is because this is the kind of climate where these systems do really well. Have moderate humidity and high summer temperatures, but it's a dry kind of heat. And this is the kind of place where you have a lot of scope for reducing temperature and then also adding some humidity to get the double whammy effect. All right, so this is a building uh, whose lobby has been cooled by the system, not the inside rooms, but it's a pretty large area. It's about 18,000 square feet. That's 1,800 square meters. And the goal was to keep the temperature in this space less than 30 degrees. Now you might think, oh, 30 degrees, that's much higher than what you're used to in an air-conditioned space. 
However, keep in mind that when one uses a lobby, one is usually coming into this lobby from outside temperatures of close to about 40 degrees in the summers. And hence a 10 degree drop immediate with fresh air can be sufficient to just provide the initial amount of thermal comfort that the human needs to cool off and then head into the building. And there were certain constraints with respect to meeting water uh, needs for such a system, so on and so forth, and the amount of air flow rate that was required. Now we're going to see whether this system was able to meet these design challenges. This system ended up providing the same amount of air flow rate that was required very efficiently with only about 48 kilowatts of power and was able to maintain temperatures of less than 30 degrees even with peak temperatures outside of above 40. So this was a very successful example of the application of indirect direct evaporative cooling in a conventional building in India. The final case study we'd like to present is the building for Suzlon. Again, this is in Pune, which is actually the headquarters of indirect and direct evaporative cooling because there are many manufacturers in the city who make these systems. The goal here was to cool all the common spaces such as the pavilions, such as the courtyards, the lobbies, etc. all cooled using indirect evaporative cooling system and they were able to achieve temperatures of less than 25 degrees throughout the year, no matter what the outside temperature was and they were able to meet this through a pure indirect evaporative cooling system. Yes, they had some help from active and other passive cooling techniques such as shading, ventilation as well, but the active cooling part was done through a indirect evaporative cooling system. So let's look at the monetary and uh, the environmental benefits that were possible through such a system. The system was able to use 47% less energy and hence have a proportionate reduction in carbon footprint which is about 50%. It reduced the water usage in the place compared to what would have been required if you had an air conditioning system with a cooling tower. So this was actually much more efficient in terms of even the water usage which is required by the way to run an air conditioning system as well. The cost was marginally higher than would have been the case with just a brute force air conditioning technology only about 10% and the payback period was within two years because of the fact that even though there was only 10% incremental cost, the energy efficiency paid off that increased cost within about two years. So this was a very successful installation of indirect evaporative cooling in a conventional office building in India. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.